Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today we're going to focus attention on the First Amendment, which is extremely important to the people in the United States and to most people around the world in all probability. My guest is an expert on this topic. Lynn Greenkey is Associate Teaching Professor at Syracuse University in the Department of Communication and Rhetorical Studies. She authored the book, When Freedom Speaks, The Boundaries and the Boundlessness of Our First Amendment Right. Lynn Greenkey, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. We're gonna get into your book in just a minute, but let's, let's go into your course first. I've heard so much about it. You apparently have an extremely interesting course at Syracuse. What is, what's so interesting about it and why do you make it interesting? Or how do you make it interesting and yeah. keep students fascinated and really want to learn more about the First Amendment? Thank you. Um, I, I love teaching about the First Amendment. One of the reasons that I love it so much is I teach it to undergraduates and they come into my class knowing very little about the First Amendment. And by the end of the semester, they can okay, they can converse about it quite fluently. And so the learning curve is absolutely vertical and it's a wonderful feeling as an instructor and as, and as a teacher. What I have learned is to teach the First Amendment as a series of stories, which is exactly what it is. Somebody did something and got in trouble for it, um, was generally prosecuted for it, and they raised a First Amendment defense. So it's the story of how that issue got to the Supreme Court and 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 what was the resolution of it. And in my book, what I also go through is often the, the um, uh, sort of like a, a, the, the end game for it and what's happened to these people, what, what's, what's happened to them now, where are they now? So we can see that, you know, these people have a life arc and their stories are important and their stories really give... Um, uh, give meaning to the First Amendment. It, we look at our U.S. Constitution, and it is, I think, anyway, and correct me if I'm wrong, a living document in that the so-called founding fathers, they couldn't get it all right at that time. They didn't, they didn't realize what was coming as far as high tech, uh, transportation efficiencies, uh, well, just different uh, values in a society. How has the First Amendment evolved since the founding of the Republic of the United States. It indeed it has evolved. In the beginning, there was more of a um, reliance and a trust of, of government authority. And as time went on, sometime in the middle of the last century, there was um, actually it sort of began in in the beginning of the of the 1900s. There was um, a, a realization that individual freedoms as an element of our natural human rights ought to be uh, given extreme protection or strong protection. And so the courts have evolved so that um, so that there's a recognition that the that our freedom to that our freedom to speak really should be the default option, that we should start with the concept that we should be able to speak our minds and only under certain limited circumstances should that right be infringed upon. Certainly, yes. Now, does the freedom of speech, is, does that apply to written and verbal, or is it just one or the other? Oh, it applies to that and it applies to much more. It can apply to dance and to art and to and to nonverbal communication. It, it, the First Amendment even applies to a situation in, where, in which one chooses not to speak. We have a freedom to speak. We also have the freedom not to speak. And that's been um, part of some of the um, more um, recent decisions of the Supreme Court. We ought not be compelled to speak about something that we don't support. Mm -hmm. And in a functioning democracy, there, there have been raging debates about what is hate speech, what should be allowed. I, I think back to the, I think it was a neo-Nazi group decades ago, it was a Skokie, Illinois, and they had some pretty outlandish parades or whatever. And the American Civil Liberties Union, which is a very a liberal organization in comparison to neo-Nazis, obviously uh, defended them. Where do we find ourselves today? Do we find that to be the case that people defend free speech even if they don't agree with it? 
Oh, that's a loaded question. Uh, well, <laughs> to begin with, the, the Nazi march on Skokie, Illinois. Skokie at the time was a town that was populated with a lot of Holocaust survivors. That has particular interest to me because I was an undergrad at Northwestern University when that was going on. And I was being taught by the wonderful uh, late professor Franklin Heyman. And he was very much involved in that, in that event. So I felt like I had a ringside seat to the discussion about that. And indeed, what happened there is the um, ACLU lost a lot of their supporters as a result of their support of the Nazis' right to freedom of speech. And I actually think that that has affected some of the decisions of the um, of the ACLU currently. I think they're, they're a little bit more, sometimes more circumspect about what they're going to take on. But whether or not um, we all understand that we have the right to say something, even if others find offensive, that's why I teach my course. That's that's why I wrote my book. Indeed, we have the right to offend. Uh, one of there are four principles that I like to talk about when I when I teach the the, uh, the First Amendment course. And the first is that the Constitution is um, regulates the the relationship between the government and the governed. The second is that what I've already talked about. The default option is that we is that we protect speech. Um, and the third, which is a little bit about what you are are talking about is that um, there are the, the, there's a difference between constitutional boundaries and moral boundaries. And the problems that we have is when people conflate or confuse the moral boundaries and constitutional boundaries. Our moral boundaries are pretty are pretty small. I mean, we we all know what's moral and, and what's wrong, but constitutional boundaries are quite vast. And it's when we want the moral boundaries and the constitutional boundaries to be the same thing. Is and they're not is when we get frustrated and hurt and angry. Mm -hmm. How does this whole concept tie into what some people call the woke cultural effort or whatever it might be into the CRT that we've been talking about? Oh, the book banning in Florida and other states by some of the executive officers and legislatures. How does that tie into that? Governor DeSantis and his Stop Woke Act, which um, the court there, the federal court, the federal appellate court, that, or I think it was the appellate court, might have been the district court, that found that unconstitutional. Um, first of all, we have to understand that there is a difference between K through 12 and universities. And that Stop Woke Act in Florida was about university curriculum. Uh, the K through 12 curriculum is quite different. There is a strong right of the localities, the state or the school boards to craft curriculum for the students. Uh, teachers have a very limited First Amendment right in the K through 12 classroom. If there's going to be um, a, action against some of these uh, book bannings and curriculum issues, the better people to argue against that are students and their parents. The Stop Woke Act, as I said, was against university curriculum and, and um, university professors and instructors have a far greater First Amendment right than K through 12 teachers. And that was what that Stop Woke Act was was all about, which hasn't gone to Supreme Court yet, but it's on its way. Is it on its way? Yeah. Well, that, it hasn't been, they haven't, they haven't appealed it yet, uh, but I, I can't imagine it's not going to make it there. Uh, it's very, very true, I'm sure. Well, this whole movement, there, there are people who oppose what the governor of Florida is doing some who support him, obviously, and that type of thing. But you've made an interesting differentiation, and that's between K through 12 and universities. It, it seems that the university people are in a totally different world as far as as far as academic freedom, freedom of speech, that type of, even though freedom of speech would apply at the lower levels too. But th th that seems like it's just a totally different ball game that we're talking about. It's, it's like comparing apples and pineapples or something. Is that not the case? Um, 
less so it's not it's not identical I, and i think that's a point i'm trying to make is that they're not exactly identical so we have to speak about them differently but you did make a really important point there are people who support Do governor DeSantis's position as well as those who oppose it and that's all what the first amendment's all about is that we ought to be able to express ourselves on all sides of an issue and the stop woke act at the university level is trying to eliminate that what the court found in that particular case what that it was that there was what we call viewpoint discrimination that the stop woke act would support one side of an issue anti crt um anti um a, a, a diversity equity and inclusion but not not in support of that and um that is something that the uh, first amendment finds repulsive and it well should <laughs> it certainly should well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with a PBS or community access television station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or you just have a podcast or you just have a computer and you like our shows and you would like to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided at no cost as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today, we're talking about the First Amendment and how important it is. My guest is Lynn Greenkey. Ms. Greenkey is a professor an associate teaching professor at Syracuse University in the Department of Communication and Rhetorical Studies. She authored When Freedom Speaks, The Boundaries and the Boundlessness of Our First Amendment Rights. This is such an important topic and it's something we all need to learn more about. There, there are battles raging, hopefully only verbal battles up to this point, but there are battles that have been going on back and forth about freedom of speech and the two big things that come up, and maybe we could talk about both of them. One is the January 6th insurrection. It, uh, a lot of, well, I'm gonna say the January 6th committee and the vast majority of the American public, according to the polls, believe that that was, an, an, well, it was basically a, a revolution to some degree. It was invited and incited by the current president at that time. How do you view that? as far as the First Amendment, the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly, uh, the freedom of uh, not attacking people physically anyway, they might attack them verbally, but where does that fit in? A lot of issues that you have mentioned there. The first, let's talk about first the people that were there, the people that um, were protesting the election and believed that the election had been stolen. Uh, this goes to the, I had said that there were four principles that I talk about, and I did not mention the fourth one. The fourth one is about um, the 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 interaction between medium and message. And that's, that's what I want to talk about with the individuals that were protesting. The fact that they were protesting, their message of protests, that they believed the election was stolen, was protected by the First Amendment. So their message was protected. The medium or means by which they communicated their message or those that did communicate their message with violence and by attacking property and people at the Capitol was not a protected First Amendment activity. And simply because you are using your conduct to communicate a message doesn't automatically uh, 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 protect that conduct from prosecution because it was infused with a message. So you can we can split those two in half. The message was fine, protected by the First Amendment. The means or the medium is what they are being prosecuted for. So that's the first part of, of the answer to the question. The second part is former President Trump. Did he incite that riot? Uh, prior to the January 6th committee hearings, I was on the fence, and I believed that it was not clear whether or not he had incited the riot. And the reason I felt that was because those people came ready to rumble. That was clear. So 
um, in order for someone to be held responsible for inciting a riot, their words have to have a causal connection in the incendiary moment. And because those people came ready to rumble, all he had to say is the election was stolen and they were going to go go to the Capitol. So I wasn't sure there was a causal connection until the January 6th committee meetings, at which point it became clear that he knew these people were armed and he wanted to join them. And that, I think, changes the equation. I think then we see an individual who had an intent to incite in the moment. And in fact, there's a causal connection between his words and the riot that followed. And it was proven conclusively that this there was a grand strategy to overthrow a free and fair election, probably as some of the Trump personnel said before, one of the fairest in the history of the of the United States. Yeah. So it certainly makes a difference. Is there a difference, though, that the people, that the mob, who just called me a surgeon mob, that they were lied to, even though Donald Trump had, they've got him on at least three or four witnesses telling them that Joe Biden won the election, it was fair, the game's over, but they continue to push the big lie. What? How does that factor into it? Again, two parts to that. So the big lie in and of itself is protected by the First Amendment. The First Amendment isn't a truth detector. Um, we can lie and our lies, uh, except under certain circumstances, which is the next part, right? If that lie was part and parcel of the incitement, then it's no longer protected. So if that lie in the moment, in the incendiary moment, was causally connected to the riot that followed, then the lie will not be protected. But merely to say the election was stolen, the um, the machine, uh, 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 the that for for Trump to say there was something wrong with the machines, um, in and of itself, the lie in and of itself by itself is protected by the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. So. At this point, as you look at it, what type of legal ramifications should there be for former President Trump and for some of the key conspirators who knew it was a lie? They, they've they come out and said it. Uh, I won't even bother to go through all of them, but they have said it. But what, what do you think should happen next? So again, two parts to that question. The first part is, is did former President Trump incite the riot? And I, that's going to be a decision for the Justice Department to prosecute. Um, do I think they'll be successful? I certainly think they can be, given what I just said. He knew that there were uh, that there were weapons there. He even said, they're not here to hurt me. And he wanted to lead them to the Capitol. So did he incite the riot? Can he be held criminally responsible for that? I think it is, it is, it is at least somewhat likely. Uh, again, it has to be beyond a reasonable doubt etc. and a criminal proceeding. The next issue is issues of defamation. And there are civil actions right now ongoing by the um by the makers of the of the uh, voting machines. Smartmatic and Dominion are the two companies that are are um suing for defamation and they're suing a, a bunch of the conspirators, including Fox News, Fox News anchors, Rudy Giuliani. And in that situation, what they are saying is that um, those individuals and the and the company, Fox News, knew or or were reckless in their in their promotion of the concept that there was something wrong with the machines, that it was as a result of the machines that 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 Trump lost. And so they're suing for defamation. Um, and um, the action has been going forward. They have won all of their preliminary motions, as I understand. It. Um, and, uh, you know, if I'm if I'm going to read the tea leaves, I think that um, Fox, uh, Fox and the news anchors and most particularly Rudy Giuliani is in a lot of trouble. And some of the perpetrators of misinformation who are news anchors on Fox actually came out and said, I didn't believe any of this nonsense, but I said it anyway, pushed it out there to gullible viewers who did believe it and really became very upset about it, even though they knew it was a lie. But it, it is, it's a major issue. I think the settlement right now, it, we don't know what it's going to be, but they've been sued for like $1.5 billion. Uh, yeah. Billion, yeah. not million, yeah. billion. It, if, it if you have the time and the energy to read the complaint, <laughs> it is very interesting. And it looks like it's a solid lawsuit. I don't, I'm not an attorney, but I, I think, think so. 
from I think attorneys. So. Yeah. Well, let me ask you quickly, we're running out of time here, unfortunately. Uh, let me ask you, Elon Musk and Twitter. We've heard debates over whether Twitter is protected by the First Amendment. Is Twitter back when Elon Musk didn't own it, now that he does, is it protected by the First Amendment? If or you it's recall a private I enterprise. Uh, in our early in the first part of our conversation, I said one of the one of the principles that I try to make sure that my students understand is that the Constitution reg, uh, speaks to the relationship between the government and the governed. Uh, Twitter is neither. Uh, well, Twitter is the governed, but it's not the government. It is Twitter is governed by corporate protocols, not constitutional principles. It is um, it is a non governmental entity. So Twitter can um, can create its own rules and it can kick people off if it wants to. Um, uh, so while when Twitter was open, was traded on the market, it was also, you know, again, governed by corporate protocols, not constitutional principles. And that did not change when Musk uh, took over ownership of it, um, except for the fact that he's changed his rules and he keeps on changing his rules. He does. <laughs> it certainly, he certainly does. And apparently he's learned a few lessons from this that he did not expect when he took over Twitter, that's for sure. Well, let's move internationally. We've seen a, a suppression, really, of uh, freedom of speech in this country, uh, book banning, whatever. We've seen people trying to rewrite history, especially with critical race theory, with trying to depict, uh, well, various groups, especially African-Americans, in a different historical context than what actually happened to them and doing so erroneously. We also see some of this going on in other countries like in Brazil, for example, in the Philippines, in Hungary, Turkey, and several others. How important is it, do you think, for these, and all those I mentioned are at the moment functioning democracies, but how important is it for them to learn more about the First Amendment? Because even if they have a constitution or don't have a constitution, if they have the First Amendment in their constitution, that's fine. If they don't, how important is it for them to realize that you have to protect freedom of speech and you also, also have to have free assembly and you have to have freedom of the press? What, what lessons should they learn from what we've been talking about today? Well, the truth is that the freedom to speak one's mind is a stabilizing force in a society. That that when speech is suppressed, it's driven underground. People don't stop talking. They just stop talking out loud so that we all can hear it. One of the theories that undergirds the, our First Amendment is this concept of the marketplace of ideas. And it's, it's really like the economic marketplace. Let's put all those ideas out there and the hope and the belief is that the best will survive, and this, the same as a as a as a commercial marketplace. The best the best products are going to su survive the competition and the assault. If you don't have all the ideas out there, then they're not that they're not being challenged and they're not being questioned. Which doesn't mean that they don't exist, but they're not being criticized and 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 put out in the sunshine so that they have to survive the assault of a debate. So it really is in order to have a stable government and a stable society, you need the opportunity to speak your mind. It is extremely important. And let me ask you, Professor, in the last 30 seconds we have, what suggestions would you have for our viewers to learn more about the First Amendment and to become much more knowledgeable of this very, very important issue and how it affects our lives. That was the easiest question you asked me today. Read my book, <laughs> When <laughs> Freedom Speaks. We've got to put a plug in for that. <laughs> it really is written for the person who wants to learn. I really do believe that you should not have to have a law degree or an advanced degree to understand the concepts behind most of our Constitution, certainly the first 10, ten Amendments, the Bill of Rights, and absolutely um, the First Amendment right to free speech. And I wrote it for that person. Um, I I think I wrote it in an engaging style. It's about the stories that uh, of the First Amendment. All of the chapters are basically stories of each concept. And I do believe that will help and hopefully bring the debate to a more educated level. It certainly will. And we encourage everyone to take a look at it. Thank well, you. Professor Lynn Greenkey, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you. My pleasure. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.